Former New York Times, LA Times food critic and editor-in-chief of Gourmet Magazine, Ruth Reichel grew up with a mom who was simply a terrible cook. She made kitchen sink dishes like everything stew, and in spite of that, Reichel became a terrific cook herself and one of North America's best food writers, if not the best food writer. Her nonfiction works tender at the bone, comfort me with apples, garlic and sapphires are compulsive reading for foodies or anyone else. Her new novel is delightful, the lovely, and called Delicious. <laughs> Did you toy with the title? No, we knew like right away. Right away that that's what we were going to call it. Really? Yeah. And did you run it by anybody? You just said. Um, no, in the minute I suggested it to my editor, it was it was a perfect. done deal. Yeah. One of my favorite characters in in Delicious is the complainer, who goes into the Fontenary Deli and they have this little tit for tat every day. It, it's it's the kind of thing I have witnessed in shops where. There's certain, I mean, there, there's a kind of relationship that um, that I've always loved, you know, where you go into a shop, um, you know they love you, but you complain, you know, mm. it's like, well, this isn't as good as yesterday. Uh, and you know that Sal absolutely, he, he's waiting for this guy to show up right. every day. Disappointed when he does it. Really disappointed when he does it. And they have a kind of call and response mm -hmm. that they both enjoy and that all the other customers sort of, you know, lean back and wait for. Well, as a New Yorker, you know that most of the theater happens in the restaurants and on the street. You don't even have to go to the theater because you just listen in on the conversations. Uh, yeah. And, um, you know, one of the things is like the complainer is you know constantly grousing about the fact that it's so slow in the shop that mm -hmm. nobody will hurry you know because new york works at this very fast pace right. and what i love is you know sal coming back to him and saying yeah you know i could push the more customers through here and make more money if i did that but i want to enjoy my life mm -hmm. and you know part of the pleasure of having the shop is that i get to have this stupid conversation well with you. and i think you said or you were quoted once as saying that uh, yes you can make piles of money or you can do what you love yeah absolutely but i bet you made piles doing what you did uh, you must have um, didn't you have a car and all that not stuff? until i got at gourmet oh absolutely mm. um, i mean i having been a daily journalist i did not know that people lived the kind of lives that I got to live at Gourmet. And, you know, I had a driver who followed me around, um, yes. hair and makeup people who came to fluff me every morning, and a you know, clothing allowance, you only traveled first class. Um, mm. And one of the real lessons of that year after, you know, I mean, I felt like a Cinderella, and now I turned back into a pumpkin, you know? <laughs> right, no shoes. No shoes. and. Um, none of that stuff matters. It's all, it's all stupid. And, you know, the notion that I had the time to be in the kitchen, to be with my family, was, um, my life was better. I understand. I have a friend who was a diplomat, and I said, what's changed uh, now that you're no longer serving? He said, well, I get in the back seat of a car and it goes nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a pretty good line. That's a great I thought, line. Mm, I sit in the back seat, N nothing happens. I actually have to drive myself. Now, uh, back to the war, because uh, uh, World War II is in here, and you did so much research on what the food really was because of the rationing, and you had to eat like milkweed and tulip bulbs. Well, I, I you know, I, the, the book sort of began with my finding this whole pile of ephemera from World War II, oh. um, things about the Women's Land Army, which I'd never heard of, and the Crop Conservation Corps. Um, so I started researching that, and then I started um, reading through these recipes that came from the Department of Agriculture, you know, how to cook on rations, how to plant a victory garden. And they're terrible. And, you know, so, mm. you know, when I, you know, Lou, when Lulu came to me, I mean, her, her first letter is, you know, Dear Mr. Beard, I'm trying to cook for my mother. You know, my mother works in an airplane factory. My father's in the war. I'm the cook. Um, these recipes are awful. And she quotes one that's called liver gems. It is maybe the most disgusting recipe. I mean, it begins where you boil liver for 20 minutes. Ooh. <laughs> and then Better than no food, but still, those times. Uh, and there was something about the, the fine research you do about milkweeds. You could actually make 
a life jacket out of milkweeds yeah, it, during the war? It turns out that during the war, Cape, all the Kapok, which they filled the um, life vests for the sail sailors with, right. all came from Japan, so we weren't getting Ooh. any more Kapok. And they discovered that milkweed, actually, the floss, has buoyant qualities. So all over America, every fall, children, school children went out to gather milkweed floss. Um, then I thought, as I was thinking about milkweed, I thought, well, if I had been cooking during World War II, I would have foraged because, yes. you know, obviously you're trying to be as frugal as possible. Sure, it's very popular now, as you know, dandelions and anything that doesn't look edible, which is people are plunking in salads, we're eating flowers, things have changed. Yeah, well, I went out and mm -hmm. took a foraging class, which was fantastic. I mean, I have discovered that, you know, my whole yard is filled with delicious purslane, for instance, which I love. Mm. Um, and then I discovered, to my real shock, that my entire driveway is lined with milkweed. And that milkweed is edible in virtually all of its forms. Well, as you know, we grew up with mothers who said, if you eat a mushroom, you'll die. Right. Or a toadstool. <laughs> and you're always thinking, is that the one that will kill me? Right. <laughs> you know, because you know you have to know a lot. Now, James Beard, who you, who, who you put, have you met him? Did oh, yeah. you meet him? Oh, yeah. I, I knew him quite well. Um, he... I dedicated this book to Marion Cunningham, who was my dear friend and sort of adopted mother. Mm. And Marion was James Beard's assistant, longtime right. assistant. And so she was always like putting me together with him, thinking he could help me in some way. And how did he help you? Um, he, he, <clears throat> he, mostly he helped me. I have to say, as Marion said once, um, the first time she introduced me to him, and she said, how did it go? And I said, well, he wasn't very interested in me. And she said, oh, he's really, he's much nicer to the boys. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he was lovely and gay. Lovely and gay, mm -hmm. but he was very, very generous with his readers. And had a Lulu written to him, I'm pretty sure he would have written have back. written back. But he said something about American food. I, it was... Uh, indigestible, something like that. Really? A long time ago, yes. And I've got the quote here someplace, so you keep talking. Okay. I'll find the quote. Because he Because really most was. American recipes are inedible to say nothing of being indigestible. James Beard. Well, that, and he set out to change that and made mm. himself sort of the father of American food. And he was the person who recognized, you know, everybody was busy, you know, looking at Europe and saying, oh, you know, the food there is so great. And he right. kept, you know, jumping up and down and saying, we have fabulous products here. And because he was from Portland and grew, his mother had a boarding house. Oh, really? And he grew up with a Chinese cook. Mm. So he also really appreciated the cooking of Asia in a way that nobody, you know, in the 40s in America had any appreciation. Okay, when you, Ruth Reichel, go into a restaurant today and you're not the critic, uh, how do you pick one? How do I pick a restaurant? Yes. Mostly I, I, I either ask friends um, of course, I know, you know, the food community is pretty small, so there are lots of friends to ask. Mm -hmm. But if I don't have friends to ask, I go on Twitter and I say, you know, I'm in Vancouver, where should I eat? And hundreds of people will answer me. It's, it's very satisfying. It's so true. And do you have a favorite restaurant in New York, a hangout restaurant, a favorite restaurant in L.A., a hangout restaurant? I, I have dozens of favorite mm -hmm. restaurants, but, you know, the place I hang out most in New York is Pearl Oyster Bar, which is like a great little lobster shack. Um, in L.A., um, I hang out at the counter at Moza, which is a fantastic restaurant. And Moza is? It's a, it's a pizzeria and pizzeria. an osteria. Because there's a masa. No, this is Moza. This is not. Okay. This is Masa is the five hundred dollar sushi plate, right? I would love to hang out at Masa. However, yes. I no longer have an expense account. So I see. I that was a shock too. I'm sure. Oh yeah. You also made an effort. You have a son. You made an effort to go home and cook family dinner, in spite of the fact that often you had to go out every night to eat and critique. I truly believe that the most important thing we can do for our kids is go home and sit down and have dinner with them. And it's not about the food. Um, it's about, you know, you, you come home and you say to your kid, what happened today? And he goes, nothing, you know? Yes. 
Because he's 13. Because he's whatever. And then you sit down at the table and you tell a story about some adventure you had today. And then Michael will tell something that happened in his office that day. And all of a sudden, Nick does have a story about what Absolutely. happened Absolutely. And the drama and the fights sometimes at the table, dare I say it. Yeah. But you get into a political discussion over dinner. And your mother says, we're, we're not talking politics. Oh, we never say that in our house. Oh, see, we, we didn't either, but we're, we also didn't agree. So there you go. The rise of the celebrity chef. Well, you know, I, I, one of probably the most embarrassing moments of my life was in when I was the food editor of the LA Times in about 1987, we did a cover with Wolfgang Puck sitting in a red convertible, waving goodbye, and I, the headline was, Say Goodbye to the Celebrity Chef. Now, how wrong can you be? I mm -hmm. did not anticipate food television and what it would do for food and food culture across America you know, and Canada. You know yes. what I mean? We are a celebrity culture, and making chefs into celebrities absolutely changed the way that food is perceived. It brought food into popular culture. Yes, and you've been a judge, right? I've been a judge Master on chef, Top, chef, and top, top chef. chef and Top Chef Canada. How much fun was that? That was so much fun. Mm -hmm. That was so much fun. And I'm a so, regular on um, Top Chef Masters in right. the States. So nothing scares you after you've written this fiction. You know, you, scary things, you know, when I'm scared of something, it's the thing I know I need to do. Oh, nice to meet you. <laughs> Thank you. Ruth Reichel. And thanks for being here with us today. There will be many more entertaining, terribly interesting, and insightful guests to come here on Shaw TV.